दी डायमंड सूत्र अवेकनिंग दी टू मेडिटेशन अवेकनिंग इज वन ऑफ द मोस्ट इम्पॉर्टेंट आस्पेक्ट्स इन लाइफ इट बिगिन्स विद माइंडफुलनेस माइंडफुलनेस इज द प्रिल्यूट टू अवेकनिंग Mindfulness is only of the smaller moments when you are doing things you can do it mindfully or you can do it in a sleeping state you come home from the office from work place or from outside you have a few things to place in first is your car key which is very important next your shoes which you need to take off before you enter the house are you mindful when you place your keys the car keys are you mindful when you place your shoes you remember that the car key is to be used again next time when you have to go out the shoes will have to be used again when you have to go out and these have to be kept in a proper place it is said that sufis never bothered about mindfulness but there are examples of the sufis being very and they are very particular in sometimes it happened a person or a sheikh does not speak or a path or tariqa does not use the terminology but it remains embedded and implicit it happened there was a sufi master called junaid a person wanted to learn something about the meditation so he came to junaid to learn about meditation as usual when we have to reach for any place or attend a program by nature mind wants to show its importance that so what if i reach 5 minutes or 10 minutes late that does not matter and then you will be inquiring from the person sitting next to you what has been spoken before that it happens so this person reach late the session has begun jannat was in the congregation so he hurriedly came in and he flung the door open as normally happens slam the door fluttered in the place was upstairs it was a rainy season so he had an umbrella he placed the umbrella he flung his shoes and went to the place for the meditation junnad looked at him and he asked him which side of the staircase did you put your umbrella and he said before i begin training for you in meditation you have to go and apologize to the shoes and to the door because you had been violent to those you had taken off your shoes unmindfully angrily or hurriedly this is something very strange you can ask me to apologize to this person or that person i can do that my ego will not mind apologizing to the person for something that i have missed but how do you want me to apologize to the shoes and to the door firstly he placed his umbrella unmindfully 
So you don't know if you put the umbrella on the left side or the right side. And when he entered, when he entered, he hurriedly was trying to rush in as he was late. So he slammed the door. The sound was heard. That's why Jinnat had asked him. You have to be respectful to everything, not only to your superiors, no, normally because of the various gains and reasons we are respectful to our superiors or from whom we have to get any kind of benefit, economic or otherwise, but to children we are not respectful. To the insentient things we are not respectful, but you remember your shoes protect you, give you a certain kind of elegance. So, Jannat said, if you cannot apologize to the door for your being disrespectful for it, because door not only protects the house, but it gives it is part of the house if it is damaged or broken it has to be replaced so finally he had no choice he went to apologize to the shoes fix the shoes in the right place apologize to the door and then came back to sit down in meditation Dunat said, this is the first lesson in meditation. This is the first lesson in meditation. You have to be respectful to everything, sentient and insentient. And whatsoever you are doing, you have to be mindful of it. When these moments of mindfulness go in a sequence and they become a part of your moment-to-moment -moment functioning, then these moments put together explode in something that is awakening. Although he did not mention the word awakening or mindfulness that Buddha had emphasized, but it was implicit, embedded into his teachings. Awakening is the key in meditation. So when you return from the work, what you can do, your whole life has been that of unconscious, doing things mechanically. Now you have to start, choose a pattern. Either you choose that every hour of the day when the clock is stuck, the hour, whatsoever event, whatsoever thing I am doing, I will be mindful about it. Or you can do first five or before I begin to do my office work, I will be mindful of five things. You will speak Greet your supervisor mindfully. Greet your subordinates mindfully. When your attendant brings a cup of tea which is normal, you will be mindful as you sip the tea. So you can follow or create any pattern for you that you like. So you decide that there are five events before you begin the work, five events during the lunch time or when the lunch is over and five events before you close the day. We do things, go on doing things mechanically, that is where we use the physical mind. You have locked the door 
and you wonder, I wonder if I lock the door. Oh, you must go and check it again. So you go and check it. You come back and report to the person, maybe your wife or your husband who said, did you lock the door properly because you have a habit of not locking the doors. So you come back and report, yet it is locked. Then again the question comes from her, did you check it correctly? If the lock Sometimes it happens, you just hang the lock and click it, but it does not go into the loop where it forms the lock for the door. You, are, you have not done this thing mindfully, so you doubt your action and you go back and check it again. This sort of situation should not happen in your day-to-day -day functioning. One need not talk about meditation. It is only ex it, it is to be experienced. An awakening is the phenomena that radiates like the sun. An awakened person is recognized by a particular by particular signs. An awakened person has united all the discordant elements within, and this radiates through his being and his presence. This is what is meant by a saint or a master, one who unites. A saint or the master is one who unites. He has united everything within him. Now the radiation that flows out of him, the light that manifests through his, through his words begins to unite something within you also. The first characteristic of such a person is freedom. He does not allow himself to be tossed by the vicissitudes of life. Fear, joy, these are the waves that arise on the ocean of life. Fear, joy, anxiety, success, and failure, these are the names given to various waves that appear onto the surface of the ocean and then dissolve. Also, he reveals in the spiritual force, also he revels in the spiritual force of consciousness. And this force, this energy is revealed through its calmness, an affable smile, the serenity, the smile, the look, the gestures, the words, and the actions of the awakened to one really constitute the language of awakening. Does awakening as a language? You may wonder. Yes, it has. And what is the language that awakening uses? The smile, a pleasant, captivating the look, the way he looks at you, the gestures, the words and the actions of an awakened one constitute the language of awakening. This is the language that he uses, this is the language that is used by the masters to guide the aspirants along the path. The sole aim of the master is to destroy the old 
habitual energies of those who have knowledge to think conceptually. To explain this fully, I have chosen two conversations of the Zen masters, Chao Chu and Nan Chong. Zen flourished in Japan, so these masters have Japanese name. Cho Chao and Nan Chong. Because no other tradition explains the conceptual thinking better than the Zen, Zen master. So this is the conversation, first conversation between Cho Chao and Nan Chong. Cho Chao. He asked a question, what is the way? Nan Chong. It is our everyday mind. Cho Chao. Is it necessary to realize it? Nan Chong. To intend to realize the way is opposed to the way. To intend to realize the way is opposed to the way, Cho Chao. But without intending, how can you know whether it is the way? Nan Chong. The way does not depend on what you know or do. The way does not depend on what you know or what you do. The way really does not depend on what you know or do not. If you know it, your knowledge is just speculative. If you do not, your ignorance is immanuate. When you have no doubts, the unlimited the universe will unfold before you and no discrimination is possible then. There should be no doubt. And when you have no doubt, the unlimited universe will unfold before you and no discrimination is possible then. The second conversation is between Cho Chao and a monk. The monk asked the Zen master Cho Chao, what was Bodhidharma's intention in coming to China? What was the intention of Bodhidharma in coming to China? Cho Chao, to look at the cypress in the courtyard. To look at Cyprus in the courtyard. The first conversation shows the obstacle of conceptualizing. This engages the questionnaire in the way of non discriminating realization. However, the second conversation shakes the habit of conceptualization and thus creates shocks that is needed for bringing awakening. When the mind of the aspirant is ripe and ready, enlightenment can happen that very moment. The master understands the aspirant and thus helps them to enter the realm of awakening. Truth can only be lived, not experimented with. Truth can only be lived, accepted and lived with it, not experimented with it. One of the great Mahatmas of 20th century you have to figure out who I am referring to, wrote a book entitled My Experiments with Truth. 
The title of the book, My Experiments with Truth. I was in my teens when my uncle, the Sufi master, gave me that book and asked me to read it. Two days I kept the book. Third day he asked me, did you read the book? I said, no. So what is the reason? I said, I could not move beyond the title of the book. The title is basically wrong. It does not matter who wrote that book, whether he is respected in the country or not, but the title is wrong. You do not experiment with truth. When you know truth, you live by it. One needs to live with truth. What can you experiment? Experimenting means there is no experience of truth. Once truth is the experience, then once truth becomes the experience, then there remains no doubt and you begin to live with truth. You know electricity, about the truth of electricity. Now you start living with it. You start using it to continue the other things. Meditators never attempt to describe reality. The master only guides the aspirant in the direction of truth. Master says, do not look at my finger. Look at what the finger points towards. This is the famous Buddha teaching, finger pointing to the moon. Awakening is the beginning in the journey of transformation then. It is the opening of the inner being. It leads to a sort of witness attitude within. And when this witness attitude comes in, that inner consciousness looks at all that is happening both in and out of you, within and without. But there is no direct interest. This further brings equanimity where there is, wherein there is no pain or pleasure and you have reached a state beyond pain and pleasure. The transcendence. Only serenity remains. One develops the attitude of being separate from the happy. You sleep. And during the sleep, in bits and parts, you dream almost one hour every night. Almost one hour every night. In dream you are walking, you are driving, you are crying. But are you really walking? But you are sleeping with your eyes closed. You are that moment simply conscious of it. You are simply a witness to all that is happening to you. This is why Hindus say this world is dreamlike. And if you can understand this and live this, awareness in a waking state, then a transformation is bound to happen. It further brings equanimity wherein there is no pain or pleasure and you have transcended the state. Only serenity remains. One develops the attitude of being separate from the happening. You are now the witness. Only observing without being the part of it. In dream, you are simply a witness, not part of that. Not part of all that is happening. Only observing without being part of it. Also it brings non-attachment to things, beings and events. 
Consciousness is the faculty that brings awareness of anything through identification. There is divine consciousness that is not only aware but also knows the effects. To be aware of something does not mean that you know everything about it. Consciousness is the force of awareness of self and things. It consists of dynamic and creative energies within. It is capable of determining its own reactions and also abstains from such reactions as well. It can only answer to forces but create or separate itself from the forces too. Usually consciousness is identified with the mind. In this form it is only within the human range. There are levels of consciousness both above and below this level. With these we do not have any contact or at least in the beginning. By consciousness I mean something that remains the same throughout. However, it varies according to the conditions and the operation. In such case, we say the consciousness is either suppressed or disorganized or it is differently organized state. This does not mean it is opposed to any specific part of the being. It is fundamental to the being and it formulates any part it chooses to manifest. In this process it develops them from ever, flows downwards from spiritual levels progressively. In this process it helps the process of evolution in matter or formulating in an upward movement for evolution to happen. It is composed of two elements. Awareness of self, things, forces and conscious power. To be aware is the first thing you have to be aware of the things and beings in the right consciousness and seeing their true nature. However, awareness by itself is not enough. It needs a will, an energy field to make the consciousness effective. You may have the full consciousness of what has to be done, but maybe helpless to effect the change. You know what is to be done, but you do not want to do it. You do not, you lack the will. Someone else may have the willpower, but not the right awareness to bring about the necessary change. When you are in true consciousness, the will and the awareness both are in harmony with the cosmic one cosmic energy. This harmony will bring the necessary change within you. And consciousness by nature is not attached from the mental or other activities. It can detach itself as its, at its will and at the same time remain uninvolved. Consciousness is that which brings awareness. Consciousness is that which brings awareness to things and energy is the force put in action to do things. Consciousness may have energy. It can keep it or put it out. But it does not mean that when energy is put out, the consciousness is also put out. 
consciousness is always there to observe this energy in action. Now one last thing remains, what is the relationship between consciousness and the mind? Human beings who have not delved deeper into themselves find both and mind consciousness as synonyms. Only when one becomes more and more aware of oneself that one can see the different degrees, types, powers of consciousness as mental, physical, psychic and spiritual levels. Mind is modified consciousness that brings forward mental energy. A man can stand back in his mental consciousness and also watch the mental energy performing acts like thinking and planning etc. With the process of introspection when it sets in, one can find that consciousness observes and energy acts. With a little practice everyone can do this and when he begins to observe his own thoughts, feelings and actions, it means the process has already begun. Whenever one wants to develop consciousness for true action, it can come in several ways. Whenever anyone wants to develop consciousness for true action, it can come in several ways. You may get the habit or the faculty of watching your movements in such a way that you can see the impulse to action coming and also observe its nature at the same time. A consciousness may come which feels uneasy whenever a wrong thought, impulse to action or feeling is there. And finally, something within you may warn and stop you from doing anything wrong. Human body has its own consciousness from where it acts. Our surface mind knows little about this body consciousness. Mind feels it only in an imperfect manner. And it only sees the result, not the cause. When one continues the journey, one can become aware of this body consciousness, its movements and also the forces that act upon it both internally and externally. As an individual, each one of us carries a personal consciousness, but it remains entrenched in the consciousness of one's own body and also in touch with his surroundings. But this happens only through his body, senses and the mind. Each moment cosmic forces are pouring into him without his knowledge. He becomes only aware of his thoughts and feelings which surface, but those thoughts and feelings that have not surfaced, he remains unaware of it. These can be considered as his own. All thoughts and feelings come to the mind from outside like waves. All these thoughts and feelings take particular form in him and surface once these get in. However, those do not enter his body immediately. He carries with him the environmental consciousness also and theosophists call it as aura. If he can become conscious of this, then he can recognize thoughts, passions, suggestions and forces of illness. Also he can prevent these from entering him. When things and thoughts are thrown out of you, they 
often do not go together. Instead, these take refuge in his environmental atmosphere. And from there, these tries to get in the game and remain outside waiting to get another opportunity to end in.